Okay, let's reconvene. Ray, you had the floor, so okay. continue. Um, so uh, to continue the questions on uh, page two, in the middle of the page, there's a whole series of bullets. Um, the first bullet is uh, update calculations of air pollutant and GHG emissions using the most updated model, including analysis of the total in addition to annual per capita emissions. And it says, for each development scenario. So I want to know what each development scenario includes, and I guess the bottom line is, does that include the renewable energy alternative? If you want to go through, do you have more questions, or do you want to kind of do these one at a time? What's your uh, Whatever pleasure? you like. I'm going to defer some of these to our consultants to respond to, so maybe we do the list and we can sort them out. Okay. Next question is that I understand that um, there has been or in process uh, an update of the traffic study from what has been already uh, included in the draft EIR, and I don't see any reference to that. So I guess my question is, so where does that stand? Um, the next question, uh, when you look under the responsibilities of the respective uh, companies. It, it, the Can second, you give us uh, pages? Right. Still on the same page. Okay. Page two. Okay. Uh, see where it says responsibilities down mm -hmm. the bottom, mm -hmm. and then the first company is Metis, and um, and then it, the the second bullet is prepare responses to comments. But shouldn't we say which comments? Which uh, you know it just says it sounds as if it's the whole thing. And uh, obviously we're splitting it up or they're splitting it up in, in some way or other. And the same thing holds on the next page with ESA. Yeah, that's defined in the back, I think. Yeah, but uh, or it should be referenced where. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 if you say response to comments, it almost says, it should say response to comments that are specifically assigned to such and so. You know what I mean? Yeah, it says that in the back. Oh, yeah, but it mean, doesn't here. Oh, okay. You're saying put it So there. it should be referenced or cross-referenced. It seemed to me anyway, so I'm, I'm trying to get it clear as to who's doing what. I'm back to the same original question, I guess, and I'm having trouble getting it all sorted out by just looking at the language here. Um, That's a water, please, Harry. Of course. Thank you. On the, on the bottom of the page uh, three, it says the, this is about the mitigation monitoring and reporting plan. Um, the last sentence is, if requested, the MMRP will be bound with the final response to comments document. Um, so I guess my question is, why wouldn't it be just as a regular, ordinary course? Why would it have to be requested, and who has to request it? I mean, <laughs> why not? Um, on that top of page uh, five. It says the following city council action on the final EIR. The final EIR will be revised to reflect any revisions incorporated by the city council. And there I was under, under uh, the understanding, I think from Mr. Zola, that uh, it's conceivable that if we come up with a plan that quite different than what's, uh, you know, studied in the, in the draft EIR, that we may need to do additional studies. Uh, and mm -hmm. so why don't we say that as a, an additional thing that may be necessary? Um, I would like a, an explanation of the statement of overriding considerations, exactly what it's meant by. I have a, sort of an idea, but I would kind of like that to be specified so I understand what we're talking about. Um,
And another thing that would also be helpful to me to be explained, and this is on page 7, um, as the scope of work provides for preparation of a, a notice of determination. So would someone explain exactly what that is? Um, anyway, those are things that were unclear to me, and I would appreciate explication. Okay. Laurie, you want to go next? So my question is um, <clears throat> for city manager for our planning. Um, in the staff report, and uh, when you spoke, I believe, uh, John, you had mentioned that the, the recology portion for the draft EIR was together, and that cost was divided between recology and UPC, whereas in the final EIR, they're going to be separated out. Is that correct? The way it works is the budget amount is total, like you see here, but among the $71,700,000 budget, there'll be a cost apportionment, a fair share uh, that UPC is obligated to fund, and uh, the remainder, which Recology would fund. And this relates to, for example, questions, comments that are unique, for example, to the recology variant, that, again, the time, the budget spent to, to deal with those kind of comments are rightfully and fairly you know, the, the obligation of recology to fund. It's, you know, the, the recology variant wasn't necessarily something UPC was proposing. So, so it breaks down the work um, and cost based on that kind of basis. And so they'll divide up that $770,000 budget among the two parties. It'll, I, I wouldn't say it's going to be in more in like the, uh, a, well, the consultant, the price on the, on the order of an 80-20 split ballpark, I believe. But, you know, Recology being responsible for 20%, UPC for 80. And don't quote me, the, the, the consultant, I think, has done some preliminary numbers on, on that basis already. Okay. Lori, can I uh, interrupt you sure. for a second? Clay, is, um, <clears throat> do you see any reason why the chief of police and fire chief need to stay? Yeah, they're on my list. No. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're more than welcome to leave. Okay, with the council? I mean, you guys can... They may be riveted by this. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they are. But, uh, if, if you wish to go... Feel free. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> so will the breakdown between UPC and Recology be different than it was for the final EIR as opposed to the draft EIR? I guess that's between them, but I'm just curious. Yes, it would be okay. different. Okay. And would that have any impact on our um, ability to recoup the, re the reimbursement with that? Would we be reimbursed in the same manner? We have a similar agreement f with Recology to pay for um, consultant services and professional services. Okay, thank you. And now that there are the, the consultants that, that uh, left ESA and are now at Metis, um, I had asked um, by email previously about um, whether there would be any duplication of tasks and whether their rates are the same or different. Can you, can you explain that, please? I hate to jump ahead of your questions versus uh, Councilman Miller's, but I, I, I guess it's up to you. I, sorry, to, I don't want to. Oh, I'm sorry. If you, if, if we want to, consultant would like to respond to, or maybe we could just group these. This could be one that the consultants at the end of. You know, everyone's going to have probably a turn to respond to various things, and maybe I'll we can put that on the list of ones <coughs> uh, sure. discussed. Okay. Sure. Um. That, that's kind of what the uh, purpose was. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Mm. And those are all the questions I had. Thank you. Okay. Terry. As far as the funding for the reimbursement schedule, on I've got a um, the cash balance and investment funding report dated January thirty first, two thousand fourteen. 
Can you tell me what fund accounts are related to the funding and reimbursement expenses? I can give you a copy. It was in our packet tonight. You're looking on the... Uh, Cash balances and investment. On the investment report? Yes. <clears throat> It looks like it's account 780 and 781. So at this time, both of those are negative funded accounts. We do send out billings on a, um, I believe, um, at least quarterly basis, if not more. Um, and uh, as I indicated earlier that if uh, and I don't remember exactly off the top of my head what the what the time frame on it is, but if they haven't paid, I think I believe it's something like 90 days. Then the uh, then I believe it's a four percent interest rate that uh, compounds with uh, with the unpaid balance. Mm -hmm. okay. I thought it was three, but um, I, and it may be three. Yeah. It may be correct. So it seems odd to me that. Um, the, this company that's been doing the work on the EIR is splitting now um, or separating and now we're going to have a contract with two people rather than one as the lead agency and one as a secondary agency who could subcontract if they so desired with the other partner. Um, it just seems that it puts the council or the city in negotiation with whose responsibility things are instead of having one um, agency that we're dealing with to prepare everything to our satisfaction. And, and so it seems that it's adding an administrative burden to the city to try to determine whose responsibility each section is and then the, the thought that we need a peer review um, to be paid separately that isn't addressed here really worries me, and I'd like more of an explanation on that for the toxics and the mediation, and whether that is just because of um, our legal want to have a secondary opinion on something that's so important and if not, why the whole document would not have a peer review. Okay. Is that it? Derek? That's it for Cliff? No. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to get back to the draft EIR, John. So um, I'm assuming that there was a proposed budget for the draft EIR process. I don't think anyone had imagined that it would the process would last as long as it did. Um, so I'm assuming that that we probably went over budget. Did we uh, on that? There were a number of contract modifications that were approved over the seven year life of that process. Number in terms of from the original proposal, absolutely the budget expanded, the scope expanded, the time of length of time expanded was all done by contract modification. So, so you know, all authorized, you know, officially through city process. Okay, and then um, for the last part of the comment period. Uh, there was question in regards to whether UPC was going to cover that or it was going to, the city was going to cover it. H have we um, worked that out yet? The question hasn't come up recently. There was a letter that was written, not a claim. There was a letter that was written, and that has not been brought up by the applicant in at least two months. Okay. All right. And then we've submitted all of the draft EIR 
bills to the applicant at so far at this time? We've continued billing as, as usual. Okay. Okay. And then, um, so we have this $771,000 proposed budget, um, but that could also expand uh, if there are other items, you know. Um, and then I guess then it will be determined who is the appropriate body to to do the work at, at that time. Okay. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, okay, you're asking my You guys are shook his head. <laughs> guys, sorry, you're answering my questions. Um, I know we're supposed to just like add those things to the to the list of questions. Um, th this is really a question I you know for for both of you guys and and and, and you can chime in too as as well. Um, you know how often are you in kind of midstream in a process where employees decide that they're not going to work for the company that they're working with and they decide to form their own thing and but they're still working together it just seems kind of strange to me and so i'd see if there's any precedence that, that that you know of the other question is that um you know would cost be lower if there wasn't a split All right, so that, that, those are my questions, uh, Mr. Mayor. Okay, I have uh, one slip here. Before we get into answering questions, uh, I have one from the public, Michelle Salmon. Michelle Salmon, Brisbane resident. I did have a question, that um, two questions that I saw on here, and one is, in the agreement on page two of seven, this is agreement for professional services under number eight, ownership of documents. Um, except working notes and internal documents, those uh, everything else should become um, property of the city of Brisbane. But I'm questioning what the internal documents are that we would not uh, own, and especially since there uh, apparently was some kind of non-disclosure, et cetera, about hazardous waste. So that's a concern to me. But the other part that's really of concern to me, and I did briefly ask during the break, but I'm, I'm really concerned about that. And this is on page two under the scope of work. And it says, re responses to comments related to the Brisbane Baylands, et cetera. So it's paragraph two. And then under the last part of that says, the following analysis will be undertaken to substantiate the information presented in those responses. Well, one of the questions that I had on the draft ER, EIR was that I felt that the biological assessment was woefully inadequate. Um, and so here it says, undertake on-site field reconnaissance analysis and a records research in relation to comments regarding on-site biological resources. And yet in the um, in, in the roles and responsibilities and also in the finances, I'm not seeing where they have accounted for having a proper uh, field reconnaissance, biological field reconnaissance, um, either under subconsultants or under any of the people listed. The only person that's listed under biological resources is uh, Patricia Berryhill. So I don't know if she... I mean, I kind of asked, do you plan to go out there yourself? I mean, so where are they going to do the biological assessment that should have been done in the first place? I don't see it in the budget, and I'm not really seeing it in the in the personnel listed either under the subconsultants or any of the personnel that are listed to do that. So I find that it's just one oversight just from my first reading of that, and that's based on what I had read in the, in the draft EIR. So it makes me concerned about other oversights, such as hazardous materials, um, and what what other things are there, and are we really going to just give pacifying answers? Or are we really going to do the work that should have been done in the first place? So that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Any other questions, Council, huh? regarding this? Okay, uh, John, honey, you, you folks want to come up? Just want to want all you just come up that way. Uh, 
we're not running back and forth. We are at 1130, <laughs> so we want to extend the meeting a bit. And Hi, good evening. <clears throat> and your name, sir, is? I'm, <clears throat> I'm Gary Oates. I'm the president of ESA. Okay. <clears throat> and with me is, uh, I think, probably a familiar face to you, Lloyd Zola. Right, and Patricia. So and, we, and Patricia. Yeah. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I guess I, I, I want to say that, uh, yes, there was a little business divorce, I guess, of, uh, of some sorts, but a very amicable one and one that uh, we're working very well with on, on this very important project, as well as a few others. Mm -hmm. That, uh, that we were working on, and the entire team is exactly the same. <clears throat> All of the technical yeah. investigators um, at ESA who worked on the project have been working to scope out the effort needed for the response to comments, um, so there's really no duplication of, of effort. Lloyd will continue to play the role that he played um, in the final EIR, that he played in the draft EIR. Patricia will continue to play the same role she played on the draft EIR and the final EIR. The city will get the benefit of my enhanced attention uh, at no additional cost. Um, I'm a president who actually does work on um, projects uh, and I've worked on a number of my own long-running high-profile projects in the Bay Area, so I'll be paying particular attention to this and make sure that we we uh, bring this EIR into a successful conclusion for the city. Um, on the matter of, uh, of cost, there's no additional cost. Uh, Patricia and Lloyd will be in our offices at those points when they need to be there. The management team really needs to be present with all the technical investigators um, who are all scoped out and schedule their time to respond to this EIR. And in terms of the cost, I think the rate that uh, that uh, Lloyd is charging in his in his new uh, role is actually a little less than the rate that we had been charging at ESA. Smaller firm, a little, little less overhead, I suppose. So, um, so I don't see any uh, any any real issues. It's not unusual for a long-running project to lose key people along the way like this. Uh, we've had we've had you know just as a fact of life, and we've had to. Uh, deal with those changes. This project has been going on for seven, eight years now, a uh, very long-running project. And actually, we've had, for the last couple of years, quite a bit of continuity in staff. So I, I feel like, um, you know, we will be able to address the city's concerns in terms of coordination on this project. Um, <clears throat> I had a number of other questions. I think I'll have to defer to Lloyd uh, specifically for some of those. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Miller, you were asking about development scenarios, mm -hmm. which I think, I which which uh, which I'll let Lloyd I'll let Lloyd go through those. Um, let's see. Do you want to do you want to just do that? You want to run those? Yeah. All mm -hmm. right. Because I <coughs> will compare lists because I was writing, trying to write them down. Yeah. I've gotten used to keeping notes as we go through some of the meetings. Um, and what I can do is run through all of the the questions that are here and. I guess if I start straying into the city attorney's role, he'll let me know very quickly. Uh, the way that, that the scope was put together, there were 2,200 or so comments, actually a little bit more than that. We identified every one. They're all numbered, organized, and then we went through each comment, each comment letter, identified who is the right person within this is while I was still at ESA, who is the right person to answer each one? And so there is a master list, and actually, you know, in terms of who is answering each comment, we could identify that very easily by comment number and include that as part of the exhibit if that would be better. Um, in terms of updating the AIR and GHG models for each scenario, the idea is first we would run because right at the end of this process, run a project eight years, the air quality districts are going to change their models. Uh, we would update the air quality GHG, and then depending on the results of that, also the um, health risk assessment for each of the four scenarios, see if there's any change in the results of that modeling, and then, if needed, we would then go to the renewable energy scenarios and into each of renewable energy alternative in, into the other alternatives. But um, we're expecting that <clears throat> running them for the first They're not called scenarios, right? I'm sorry. The other alternatives. The, right. Yeah. The renewable energy alternative and the other alternatives. So 
from my point of view, you know, that kind of explanation would be nice to have in writing. And, and that we can put in there. Mm -hmm. um, the, the question came up about the update of the traffic study, and there was also a comment earlier about recology being separate in their process. And actually, as part of the recology EIR, they are looking at um, operations up along Geneva. So the work that is ongoing right now, one piece is looking at um, work along Geneva, closely spaced intersections, getting recology vehicles in and out. So there is some study going on there, as well as there is a contract or an agreement for um, Farron Pierce, the traffic sub consultant, to look at an enhanced transit scenario. What would be ways of maximizing use of transit? What kinds of design alternatives? What kinds of land use alternatives? And so Farron Pierce is looking at that as part of the response to comments. So there's two pieces going on on traffic. In response to the... Um, is that specified anywhere? Yeah, under sub-consultants. Yeah, we did not specify contracts that are already going on in this contract, but I think as part of, we could identify that there are those two th issues going on under separate contract, identify them so that there is a record of that as part of this EIR, this um, contract. Uh, let's see. In relation to the mitigation monitoring and reporting program, different cities run that, run that differently, whether they want it included in the final EIR or whether it is a separate document than the final EIR. It's the city's choice, and it's basically a formatting issue. And so we have provided in this contract Either way, whatever is the ultimate decision of U.S. City Council is, is how we would organize the mitigation monitoring and reporting so, so program. if requested by the city, it huh? mm -hmm. doesn't say that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if requested by the city, that okay. we could do. Um, the revisions to the draft EIR that would be incorporated into the final EIR, uh, this scope of work would bring to public hearing essentially the final EIR for the proposal that you now have on the table, which is the uh, UPC's application for a general plan amendment, uh, the specific plan application for two scenarios, the four scenarios of equal level of detail, the alternatives, the water supply agreement, remediation, so on. At the end of this process, when there is a final EIR, you will then hold planning commission hearings, city council hearings, and the discussion that would occur in front of the planning commission, ultimately in front of the councils, what do we do with this application? Do we approve applications? Do we approve them? Do we approve them with some minor modifications? Do we approve them with major modifications? Do we not approve any of them and move on with a different project description, or do we simply say, we're not going to approve this, but we have a discussion as to what would be approvable? So that second part that, that you mentioned, if there is a determination on the part of the city council at the end of the public hearings that none of the alternatives, none of the scenarios work exactly right, that you aren't comfortable with approving any one of them, but that some combination of alternatives or some different project different than what is in front of you now would be appropriate, then what would happen is that is the point. You would then direct new environmental studies to a new, related to a new project description. Mm -hmm. So the basic process would be conclude the final EIR for the project as it is now proposed, or the program as it is now proposed. You would go to public hearings, make a decision. What do we do? Do we move with a different project description? And that is, if you decide we want to change this project description, we want a very different project, that is what would start that process of additional environmental studies beyond the final EIR. So it sounds to me that that also needs to be sort of uh, mentioned or specified or in a footnote or something because of what it talks about here is, is certifying the final EIR and that intermediate step which you just mentioned, which is a possibility, 
is not referenced at all. And right. Probably would need a you know a new contract and so forth. Yeah, because uh, shouldn't we reference that mm -hmm. somehow? That could be done. Yeah, and one of the things that you had, that, that council talked about, and when we talked about process very early on, was do you that you would make a decision? Do we certify the final EIR? Do we not certify the final EIR? Do we proceed so we can give a little bit more background in terms of that positioning of this document? That p potential intermediate mm -hmm. step, right? Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, in terms of the, of the statement of overriding considerations when the project would come forward to a public hearing with the um, final EIR. Obviously, there are significant unavoidable impacts in that, and um, at such time it would be appropriate to do findings if those findings and, and if the determination was an approval of some kind then there would be a statement of overriding considerations written for the action that you were going to take. And I'll anticipate your next comment. We could describe what those overriding considerations would be written to, as opposed to just that, that project. Um, as part of the, the comments and discussion about the final EIR, UPC had asked for um, what is the appropriate split between how much of this effort for the final EIR is really dealing with recology and recology issues. Uh, and we did actually take a look at that, and we had recommended uh, a split of about 85% to UPC, 15% to um, recology as the proper, as what we saw as where the effort would lie. Uh, question about duplication of tasks, and actually because my rate, Patricia's rate, will be lower than it was before. Uh, net from my original scope of work, uh, there will be about a $21,000 actual reduction in costs in the way that, that this is set up now as opposed to as it would have been before. Uh, question on, and, and here is where I will talk slowly, more slowly than I'm used to. Um, in case the city attorney jumps in. As we looked at the issues, and we can describe this a little bit better and work this through with, this, with the city attorney's office, in relation to toxic, toxics and remediation, some of the comments that we received, or a lot of comments we received, questioned first the adequacy of the underlying studies used for the draft EIR, also questioned the review that the subconsultant for the draft EIR did of those studies. So based on that, the determination and what we all believed was, was most appropriate, when I say we, myself, ESA, staff, and city attorney, was to have a separate consultant who did not prepare the original studies, who did not use those studies to work on the EIR section, go back through all of the studies, the use of the EIR, and then make a determination as to the adequacy of those studies in, in response to the comments. And that is what the reference to that peer review was. So that would be part of the responding to comments, but dealing with that very specific, those comments dealing with that, that say the underlying studies are not adequate and the peer review did not come to the appropriate conclusion. Uh, in relation I, to... So I, I hope that <clears throat> this gets tricky, I know. That, that David is sitting on the edge of his chair. <laughs> uh, I'm hoping that we could somehow say, make some reference to that so that, uh, you know, the public is aware that, uh, of this issue anyway. Yeah, I uh, think... Uh, I, I know we have to be careful how we state it, and that's what we have a city attorney for, right? We'll find the appropriate wording. Yeah. And is that just as to the hazardous materials? Is that that was the issue. That was, yeah, and we'll talk, I'll talk about biology next, but that was the place that, that we determined it was best to bring in a separate consultant. No, no, that's prudent. Let's stop there for a second. Yeah, I just wanted to, to, to jump in because I think that's a segue into Council Member O'Connell's question about why it's structured differently for the, the hazardous materials review rather than for the entire EIR. And because of the, the importance uh, and some of the questions, we felt that it, it was critical to, I mean, for 
purposes of, of reassuring the council, the public, and getting a correct uh, and thorough review of all the issues related to, to, to the toxic substances, to bring in uh, an outside peer reviewer to take a look and do an independent analysis, that becomes something where there is an argument that it is duplicative and, uh, and more expense. And to do that for the entire EIR would basically create an, an entirely new EIR process that we would not be able to justify either economically or in terms of time. So that's why the focus was on the hazardous materials section uh, because of its its importance and uh, critical nature of the the entire EIR. Uh, again, to address your question, Councilmember Miller, uh, the intent was to refer to the separate scope of work for that without, of course, being, being specific. Uh, I think that it is mentioned and is in the, the scope of work already, at, uh, but we can certainly take a look and see whether there's something that might be a little bit more uh, to address your, your concern. I also wanted to just to reiterate the fact that what we're talking about here is really a scope of work to <coughs> allow the consultants to begin their, their review of the, the comments and draft the final EIR that coming separately to the council when we figure out a date when we can actually have the, the, the workshop, the goal setting workshop, is what we've been talking about and what a, the subcommittee is aware of in terms of a pretty extensive white paper that really addresses the process and I think answers a lot of the questions that you have about what are the options, I mean, what directions can this go, that would not be appropriate for the scope of work, but is appropriate for the separate white paper that will be. Yeah, no, I understand it. Yeah. Okay. Almost at the end. <laughs> no, I think that the last question was the one that was raised regarding biology. And a number of the comments that we received in relation to biology are we're in a drought time. Uh, we're at the end of, maybe not the end, but we're within a, a several year drought period and doing a biological survey based on a slice in time, essentially the NOP baseline, will show and did show a different area of wetlands, different type of biology than you would find at the end of a series of wet years. And so part of the response to comments is going back into historic research, historic studies on the site looking at issues where there have been impacts of past activities that have created um, impacts or past activities that created impacts that have not been mitigated or where mitigation agreements were entered into not implemented and we are working with the city attorney's office as well as with special counsel as to how we can capture those impacts going back in time as opposed to the typical in this case 2010 baseline and we have been working particularly with special counsel on doing that that will be part of what we do on the biology and the reason that explanation was not provided in the scope of work is I did not want in the scope of work to start describing how we are going to respond to comments but that type of research will be part of this as opposed to doing we looked at doing more field surveys, more field surveys in an even drier year than 2010 are going to show kind of the opposite of what we're getting from some of the comments. So the field work we will do um, will look more at um, conditions where, in terms of wetlands, they could be in a wet year, what would be plausible in projecting forward to wet years compared to past activities, and that will be the basis of our response to comments in that arena. Um, I think the last one, and as, as Gary did say, any l project that goes on a long time in this, in this um, <coughs> industry we have, there is personnel that changes over. And typically, it's probably more typical that um, as people come and go, we tend to subcontract or work with, as partners, our old companies work together to make sure that there's continuity on projects in the case of the Baylands, the one thing we can't get people to do is when they retire, bring them back from <laughs> retirement. And unfortunately, we went through some retirements. And so what we had agreed to uh, in terms of, of moving forward with the situation that I have with Gary now, 
um, is we would work together on this, working as partners, which is the way that we had worked all the way through. And so the, the promise I've made to, uh, to John and to um, Clay and to the city attorney, I'll make to you also, in terms of how we move forward in, term, in, in our team, the only thing you will notice is I have a different email address because my cell phone stays the same, so that won't change either. So that is the way that we'll work forward, the very same way we did before with the very same people, the same Thursday afternoon meetings before our Friday morning calls, and we'll package the, the document exactly as we would have otherwise. NOD. Ah, notice of determination is, and, and yes, thank you. That was on my list. I went right past that one. Uh, that is a notice of, of determination filed after an action is taken by the city and anticipating your, your comment. We can describe what that is and uh, what's, under what circumstances would it be filed because if the action, if no action or if no action is taken certifying the EIR, you may not do that. So we'll get that description in there. And, and, and with the NOD, as we call it, the, the MMRP needs to be available at that time, at the absolute latest. Okay. If you choose not to include it in the EIR document, it has to be made available at that time. Uh -huh. okay. Can you clarify with respect to the hazardous materials peer review? Would that be um, an independent consultant reviewing your proposed responses to comments, or would the independent consultant be preparing their response to comments? Okay, the, the, the first step that, that would be taken, and that is um, what city attorney referred to, would be a review of those comments that were received on the draft EIR related to adequacy of the underlying studies, as well as use of those studies in a program EIR, and then that consultant would make a recommendation on were those studies adequate for you, you essentially what a response to those specific comments would be. Then from that recommendation, from that review, then we would determine the appropriate means of responding to the balance of comments on hazardous materials. Okay. Thank you. Any other council questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Very much. <clears throat> Sorry I had to stay so late. <clears throat> Council's pleasure on this. Um, I had a thought. I mean, <coughs> um, it, it does look as if, uh, you know, there's a, a willingness to prepare some additional language to help us know exactly what it means. Um, but on the other hand, we want to move it ahead as expeditiously as we can um, so I'm wondering if we could use the subcommittee process the Bayland subcommittee to you know be a part of that process so at least uh, and, and then but the council would have to agree to that of course uh, but I'm first asking is that okay with the staff and then and then of course the council is gonna have to decide whether they want to do that or whether they want to make everything come back to the council that's kind of up to you all I think it'd be good to have a subcommittee recommendation come to the council, you know, like we do mostly everything else. That you guys vet it out and then mm -hmm. bring a recommendation to the council, and then at that point. But what's before us is would we authorize the city manager to execute the agreement? Well, I, I would up say to a certain amount, and then go back and look at the wording and everything like that. I'm, I'm I think okay. we could. Uh, move forward with that give, give our intent to do so but uh, uh, I think the motion needs to indicate that you know, the, the language is going to be you know, modified so I don't know how we do that uh, we, can, we can certainly express our intent but you know dependent upon the agreement uh, for the language uh, running through the subcommittee and maybe even coming back to the council I don't know if we're going to do that or not but something of the, to that effect it's on. There's a couple of options that I've, I've seen used in this situation. I mean, one would be if the, the council believes that its direction is clear, then what it would do would be approve the, the agreement as presented uh, subject to the modifications to the language uh, as directed by, by council. 
and the approval of the, the city manager, uh, city attorney, and other appropriate staff as to those language changes, and then it would not require coming back to either the subcommittee or the or the council. The other options would be to either have it come back to the, the council directly uh, with those language changes for final approval or go through the subcommittee before. Um, but those are three options that are available to the council. What's my, the timing? My, my two cents worth. Um, I, I do think the idea of, of having um, staff work with the subcommittee would be a really good idea, uh, given the uh, uh, breadth of changes uh, you, you've suggested tonight. Um, there, the other issue is that we are motivated to try to move this process along. Mm -hmm. um, so if the council felt comfortable uh, directing or approving this subject to um, that review with the subcommittee, um, based on the comments you made tonight, um, I think that would be the most expeditious way of moving this forward. And I think the probably the most uh, efficient way of moving it forward, also. Okay. I'm okay with that. Cliff, okay. when you. Cliff. Yeah, sure. Terry? Can I sure. ask one question? Um, ESA and Metis Environmental Group, um, what kind of corporate or, or partnership designation do they have after their corporate name? I have to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> as, as of tomorrow, when we get the uh, paperwork back from the Secretary of State, Metis will be an LLC. Okay. And it will carry all the same insurance as ESA required, as required by the city. Continue to be a California incorporation for 45 years now, running an S Corp. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, are you okay with that methodology of uh, doing this? Yes, I think sending it, approving it with the changes and sending it to the subcommittee to work out the details is the most expeditious manner. I'm comfortable with that. I'm going to give us a proposed motion there, Mr. And City that, Attorney. That and subcommittee that is, is Cliff and Ray, I think. Mm -hmm. Right, correct. Cliff and Ray. Okay. The suggested motion would be to approve the contract for Metis and ESA uh, and the attached scope of work subject to language revisions uh, consistent with the council's comments and recommendations and approval by city staff and subcommittee prior to execution of the agreement. That's your motion, Ray? No, that sounded great. Okay. <laughs> Is that your I'll second, second that. <laughs> sure. Second. Okay, motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we're about two minutes before midnight. Council's pleasure on the rest of the agenda. Staff, is there anything that we Just the um, establishing the goal setting work plan session. Okay, you want to give us a proposal? We got I, a TBD I, on there. Yeah, I believe in my conversations with each of you that perhaps next Tuesday evening, March 25th, starting at 6 o'clock, might possibly work. Yeah. So from roughly six to nine, we'll have two items. One is the review of the work plan, and then the second is what we've been referring to as this uh, Bay Lands processing white paper. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Next Tuesday, six to nine, and we don't have a meeting next Monday. Correct. That's fine. And we talked about having it as like a dinner meeting, so. Um, not sure. I just uh, what, to see. Yeah, I mean, do, would you like dinner served? I mean, we can do that. <laughs> I'm not suggesting it. It's just that that's what I had Sorry. heard. No, well, we've done that. In <laughs> we the have past. done. Yeah, we've done. Or we bring sandwiches. sandwiches. Usually, it's deli sandwiches. Yeah. Well, it's it's, it's yeah, it's not exquisite. Yeah, uh, it's not really dinner <laughs> served. I just wanted to know whether or not to eat beforehand. Salami <laughs> yeah. sandwich. Well, I mean, it's your. I mean, we need to know, but it's your pleasure if you want to have yeah. a working dinner. Yeah. No, I'd like for us to have sandwiches. I think that'd be nice. Okay. Okay. We'll do. Okay. All right, that's it. Okay, so the 25th of March and uh, goal setting session. 6 p.m., okay. 
Okay. Um, everything else? All right. Oral communications number two. I got one slip here from Michelle Salmon. <coughs> Thank you, Gary, Lloyd, and Patricia. Sorry to keep you even later, but in view of tonight's um, conversation regarding the ordinances and building ordinances in, in the Brisbane Acres um, and the approval of the project, you've sort of left the door wide open right now. And uh, that's of grave concern to me because you've not only opened the door, but you've said that, you know, you can't uphold the ordinances that we have right now and that they don't meet the general plan. So I'm asking the City Council to enact an emergency moratorium on accepting any further permits on approvals in the Brisbane Acres until we can put the zoning ordinances in alignment with the general plan and have ordinances that we can uphold. And asking for a moratorium is a serious issue, but maybe it'll light some fire under some people to get this done. Um, and I think it needs to be done before we've destroyed everything. And this was a really a clear case of, of, of having to approve something that I don't think that we really wanted to, but that's what the law stated because it was ambiguous. And I think we need to close that door right now before we have any other emotional, disappointed families, any other laws that we can't enforce intent that we can't act on what Ray said really resonated and I, I think I would I really ask the council to put on an emergency moratorium on accepting any more permits for approvals for any construction in the Brisbane acres until we have our ducks in a row and I, I ask this in all seriousness and it's it is a serious issue and I don't know how you go about that I don't know how you can accomplish this but you know, the Planning Commission has canceled many meetings this year because there was no public, you know, permit process. They can maybe work on some of the ordinances and tightening them up and bringing them to the council. I know the Baylands is a big focus, but we can't, we can't forget mm -hmm. what we're doing here because that's what really, you know, a major portion of who we are. So I really seriously ask you to put this on your agenda for the next meeting and to act on it. Thank you. Michelle. Okay. Um, at this point, we're going to adjourn. There's oh, go ahead. I just wanted to respond, Joel Diaz. I just wanted to respond to that comment, and I actually had some other comments as well. But I think that um, an emergency or urgency moratorium on building homes is is a knee jerk reaction. It's way over reacting to the situation. I think that the unintended consequences of such an action are, um, you know, they can't be predicted. Um, given the, fr the fragile state of our economy, our local economy, I don't think that's a good idea. We don't know exactly what that would do over one house. It seems a bit of an overreaction. Um, you know, also given our city's reputation for being, you know, sort of no growth, I don't think that's going to help if this is how we react to a single home being built. Um, and I think, you know, economically speaking, it'll adversely affect all of the citizens, all of the homeowners in town, potentially. And you would need to have some sort of thorough analysis of what that means, what the real net um, losses might be in the devaluation of people's properties. Um, it's a serious undertaking, and it's not to be taken lightly. And it would be, it could be very hurtful to people, especially now with the economy. It's not robust the way we'd like it. Um, so, you know, if it were, if we were a Palo Alto or Hillsboro or something and we had disposable income in the millions, all of us as homeowners, maybe we could talk about those things. Those would be nice luxuries. But it, this isn't the case. And I sympathize, sympathize with Michelle and where she's come from. And I, she posted a picture of Brisbane from the 1960s, and it's an amazing view of the town and the way she was raised and all the open space. And from her point of reference, it, it probably does seem tragic the way things are now, you know, but from my point of reference and most of the people that live here, it's not that dramatic of a change. And there has to be some reasonable allotment for growth 
socially, economically, environmentally speaking. There has to be a triad of balance. It can't be just one-sided. So I'd ask you to think about that before you would ever entertain something so, so drastic. Um, and then just on the other thing that I wanted to talk about was the swimming pool fees. And I hope it doesn't sound trivial, especially this late at night and stuff. But I, I think it's really important in the context that it's so much money that we spend operating the pool that it's, it's imperative that we get the highest quality um, out of that facility. And what I was talking about was not raising the fees for homeowners, for residents in Brisbane, but raising the fees for non-residents. And part of the reason is, is because we, the fees are so low, it gets very crowded during high use times, during the summer especially, and we get this crowd of people that are sort of poorly behaved, and there's a lot of profanity, racial epithets, and, you know, we all want a safe and relaxing environment, right? And that's what makes us want to go to certain venues. And when you remove that element of it, safety and, and, and comfort, you, you know, it, it's not fair to the residents. Uh, we're paying it. We're, you know, footing the bill, essentially. And, you know, the, the unintended consequence of, of keeping those rates so low um, is that we actually preclude the chance of having people that are well behaved or better behaved uh, paying a few dollars more to come to that venue to be there for that that privilege of having a safer more relaxing environment so they're not going to want to come if there's a bunch of people that are misbehaving and crowding the place up and making it very uncomfortable to enjoy so that's sort of an unintended consequence of keeping those rates so low and um the the i'm, I'm disappointed to see that that the Parks and Rec Commission didn't change that weekend rate for the non-residents. That stayed the same. And I think that was the whole point. I spoke to them at one point. It was that they should really look at changing that, raising the rates for those folks so that we could encourage a different segment of people to come and, and patronize our pool, like like um, Stu was saying, that you know maybe we should consider what type of people we want using Mission Blue. You know, Do we want it to be a higher quality type f facility? Um, and it's, I think that's the same thing with the pool. And I would hope that if they, if you compare it to other pools and what they're charging, that you compare it to a high quality uh, pool. You know, it's like a, a PGA golf course. You know, they're going to charge a significant amount of money to play on that course. You're not going to charge your standard municipal rates, for example. So um, that that was uh, what I wanted to say about the swimming pool fees. And I, I'm glad that you're going to look at it again in October. And I would just hope that you don't forget about this and really just think about it because it is a great deal of money that we're spending to have that facility open and losing money on it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Joel. Okay. Bonnie, you don't want to say anything, I think. <laughs> You're the last person sitting. Okay, thank okay. you. All right, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna adjourn to a closed session right now. And uh, thank you all for coming and participating. If if all our people's leave, can't we just sit right here and finish our closed session? We can. We can, but we got somebody in the doghouse over here. Yeah. So it's better just to. So get we're in. skipping the subcommittee oh, reports okay. tonight. Yeah, they got closed yeah. down. Okay. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah, I I like skip past that. Right okay. okay. Next time. Caddyshack. Is that what you mean, uh, Clark? Uh, At what point do we talk about the rest of the shack. schedule? Because I had summer issues I was going to bring up. But. Yeah, go to the Caddyshack. Yeah. Not yet. Next, yeah. next okay. meeting.